Hello, welcome to OVN Offload, the next generation, starring OpenShift and Bluefield 2. My name is Dan Winship. I work for Red Hat on OpenShift and Kubernetes networking. And as a lot of you already know, that involves a lot of OVS on the OpenShift side. So today I'm going to be talking about some upcoming work in OpenShift to take advantage of new hardware offloading possibilities. This talk is about OpenShift and the OVN Kubernetes CNI plugin, but the general idea applies to anything using OVN or even raw OBS. Also, I'll be talking about the NVIDIA Bluefield 2 card because that's what we're working with currently. But other NIC managers are doing similar things, and many of these ideas would work with other existing or soon to be released NICs from other vendors, not to mention the already announced Bluefield 3 and 4. Also, as I sit here recording these slides, I see that my talk is going to be following after another OVN offload talk. So sorry in advance if I end up duplicating a lot of the points from the previous talk. So what does OVN Kubernetes offload look like currently? Well, if you're familiar with OVN offload on OpenStack, it's pretty similar. OVN Kubernetes tells OVS on each node to do hardware offload. Then instead of using VETH pairs to attach pods to the OVN bridge, we use SRIV VF VF representer pairs. From the host, this looks basically the same as using the VETH pair, but the difference is that the card can send traffic directly to the VF after OVS offloads a flow to the card telling it when to do so. So this is the basic idea. The first packet takes the slow path where it comes in off the network, is delivered by the NIC to the host, ends up on the OVN bridge, and eventually gets routed into a container by some combination of open flow rules. But then once OVS has offloaded that flow, further packets in that connection can bypass OVS and the host network namespace and get routed directly from the NIC into the container. And this is great, but it's really just OVS fast path offload. Each node still has to run the OVS slow path, which in turn means it needs to be running OVS v switchd. And then on top of that, each node also has to run OVN controller for OVN and OVN cube node for OVN Kubernetes. And all these things are using up RAM and CPU that could be used for end user workloads instead. There are also some other reasons for wanting OVN Kubernetes offload, but we'll get to that later. So this brings us to the blue field too. What is it? Well, basically you take a ConnectX6 card and then you glue a Raspberry Pi onto it. Ta-da! Okay, seriously though, it's basically the networking capabilities of a ConnectX6 plus an ARM system running on the card to manage the NIC, which is separate from the host system that the card is installed in. There are a few different modes that the card can run in, but in the one we're interested in, the ARM system basically acts as a man in the middle between the host and the external network. It can control what packets make it into and out of the host, and it can run arbitrary additional software to monitor, analyze, and filter the packets. NVIDIA calls this a DPU, or data processing unit. Uh, but there isn't any industry-wide consensus on the terminology yet, and other vendors are using DPU to mean slightly different things, like NICs with programmable FPGAs. Uh, the nice thing about NVIDIA's version of the DPU idea, though, is that you have this fully generic ARM64 Linux system that you can run anything you want on. You can even reflash it with a different Linux distribution if you don't like the one that it runs by default. Um, so these are the specs. They're already pretty good. The upcoming Bluefield 3 and 4 models are each a notch more powerful. Who knows where we're going in the future? So what can we do with this? Well, obvious first step is to move all the remaining OVS and OVN processing off the host onto the NIC to free up resources on the host. So we move the OVS slow path processing, the switchd OVSDB server from the host to the NIC. And then we move, move the OVN components that program OVS, OVN controller and OVN cube node from the host to the NIC. And then we're not sure, maybe other networking stuff, maybe it would make sense to run DNS on the, the NIC instead of on the host. We're actually still figuring this out, um, work in progress. One catch is that the ARM system, while it may have a lot of RAM, it probably has a slower processor. Uh, and so while offloading stuff will free up resources on the host, the offloaded software will probably also run slower on the ARM than it did on the x86. This is especially a problem for disk access because the default drive on the, the NIC is a flash, a flash drive, which will be much slower than whatever was on the host. Um, you can, there, there is actually an M.2 port, so you can add 
SSDs to the blue field if you need to do real storage. But from OpenShift's perspective, we have to assume that some users are not going to do that. Possibly many users, most users will not do that. So we have to be able to deal with the, the base level storage, which is slow. So we need to be careful not to use it too much. Um, so as I said before, the ARM system acts like a man in the middle. We can take advantage of that to add additional security and monitoring functionality to the cluster. In the mode that we'll be running it in, the host has no privileged access to the ARM system. The host just sees the NIC as a NIC. So even if the host cluster is compromised and the attacker gets root on one of the nodes, they wouldn't be able to bypass whatever restrictions the ARM system was imposing on them. It, it's essentially a completely separate computer. So that's the what. Now we have to figure out the how. We have this set of ARM systems, which we need to install a bunch of software onto, including the base OS, OVS, OVN Kubernetes, and eventually arbitrary end user workloads. We need to be able to monitor these systems and manage them and coordinate which end user workloads are running on which systems. And then eventually we'll need to upgrade the base OSs on all of them and all the other software. And this sounds like a hard problem, but you know, as it happens, we know how to do that. Uh, we can just run OpenShift on the NICs. So we'll manage the ARM systems on the NICs by creating an OpenShift cluster and installing that and using that to manage and monitor the software on all of the NICs. Uh, we can install CoreOS onto each NIC using the normal OpenShift bare metal installer uh, because flipping back to the, the picture, in addition to the two high-speed ports, uh, each blue field also has an RJ45 management port, uh, which lets you do all that management ports type of stuff like IPMI. Uh, so you can get the card to netboot, install a new OS that way, um, do whatever you need. So we install RCOS on the NIC, that includes open vSwitch and, and Kubelet. Later we can run OV and Kubernetes as a daemon set and should all work. Um, one note, when we talk about managing the NICs as an OpenShift cluster, it's actually a separate OpenShift cluster from the one that the x86 hosts are part of. And again, that's the, the separation of security. We want it to be that if, if an attacker breaks into the host level cluster, they still have no access to the NIC level cluster. So the OVN databases and OVN Kubernetes master components will run in the host cluster, just like normal. Uh, the NIC cluster will run a new DPU network operator that sets things up so that the OVN Kubernetes node components in the NIC cluster can talk to the Kubernetes API server, OVN Kubernetes master components, and OVN databases in the host cluster. Um, so on the host nodes, we don't run OVS or OVN controller, uh, and we run OVN cube node in a special DPU host mode where basically all it does is the CNI pod setup parts, and then it uses SROV VFs, virtual functions, rather than Vs. On the NIC nodes, we run OVN cube node in a different special mode, DPU mode, which runs basically everything except the CNI pod setup parts, uh, and instead just watches for pods being created on the host and attaches the corresponding VF representers to its OVS bridge. The ARM nodes will also be configured to do the, the traditional OVS offload. So this is what we end up with. This, it's sort of a stretched out version of the original offload diagram with the OBS bridge now running on the ARM system between the low level parts of the NIC and the, the x86 host. The addition of the ARM system means that now there's never any open flow processing done on the x86 host. In the slow path, the packets go from the NIC to OBS running on the ARM system and then to a pod in the x86 system. In the fast path, the packets go from the NIC directly to the pod. The x86 host doesn't have to do any processing before the, the pod in either case. So where are we with this? Uh, we did a proof of concept version of it earlier this year. It was you know, basically duct taped together. The, the NICs were actually running full RHEL rather than RCOS because we didn't have the RCOS install ready. Uh, but it demonstrated that the general ideas will work. Um, we're working now on a dev preview release in OpenShift 4.2 or 4.10. Uh, we now will actually be running an OpenShift cluster on the NICs, 
Um, the overall architecture is mostly what I've described here. Uh, it's it's still a little unpolished. Uh, installing it is, is going to be tricky. Uh, the big problem is that upgrades are going to be a mess. Um, so in OpenShift, when you upgrade from, say, 4.10.3 to 4.10.4, uh, the cluster version operator handles running that. And part of that involves taking each node one by one, migrating all of its pods to another node, and then rebooting the node into the new CoreOS image. So the problem is, right now, there's no uh, coordination between the host cluster upgrades and the NIC cluster upgrades. So the NICs will end up rebooting while their hosts still have pods running on them, causing a temporary network outage for those pods. Uh, so this isn't great, but it only happens during upgrades. And this is dev preview. You shouldn't be running it if you can't deal with things like that anyway. It will be fixed in the tech preview release. Um, so the idea here will we'll smooth out the install and update process, uh, fix the upgrade problem. There are a couple other things. Um, the current architecture requires that you actually have some additional ARM servers as master nodes for the NIC cluster that are separate from the, the Bluefield 2 ARMs. Uh, we want to get rid of those. So that, that should hopefully be fixed in the tech preview release as well. And then you know, we'll be looking at resource usage in the NIC cluster. There are probably some OpenShift components that run by default that, that we can get rid of and you know, to, to save cycles. Um, and, and you know, other stuff that we learned from looking at the dev preview. There are also a few features like IPsec offload that we want to support, uh, that the support for them isn't in mainline kernels yet, so we can't have it in 4.10, but hopefully will in 4.11. And then longer term, we want to allow the end user to put their own workloads into the, the NIC cluster. I mean, you know, monitoring is, is the big uh, use case there. Um, you know, maybe they could set up strange routing, VPN tunnels, um, you know, who knows what people are going to want to do with it. It's, it's a Kubernetes cluster. They can run anything they want to. That's, that's kind of the point. Um, the other thing that, that we are going to be dealing or looking forward to in the future is HyperShift, uh, which is a new architecture for OpenShift to, to support users with multiple clusters better. Um, in, in the HyperShift model, you have one cluster that runs the control planes for all of the other clusters. And that essentially means that then creating a new cluster is almost as fast as just adding a node to a normal Kubernetes cluster. Um, so that has a bunch of important things going on. Uh, but for our purposes, it really simplifies the host cluster versus NIC cluster thing, because then you can just run the control planes for both of them on your HyperShift nodes. And that is basically all I have for now. Um, so I did want to add, um, while I'm the one doing the presentation, most of the actual implementation work was done by other people, uh, namely Fabrizio D'Angelo, Eric Garver, Pan Lu, Billy McFall, Balash Nemeth, and Sung Wei Shi. So that is all. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Dan, uh, for that presentation. Uh, I believe that uh, Dan is here and uh, can answer questions live. Uh, welcome, Dan. Hey. So, um, uh, oh, uh, please go ahead. I, I, I was gonna. There were two questions already, but if, if you want. Yeah. To... Um, what if I uh, What if I read you the the, the questions? Uh, Oh, and now we have a third. So uh, the, the first one I saw was from Nikhil Sima, uh, who asks, is, is our, our DPUs positioned to eventually uh, replace the CX, CX, et cetera, or do they exist separately for different use cases? Uh, so uh, what, what's your thought there? So th th this is just my thoughts, because of course these are NVIDIA products. and Of and course, I, I know you don't NVIDIA represent people. NVIDIA. Yeah, as far as I know, they're still planning on selling the the simpler models as well, because I'm pretty sure they're a lot cheaper. Um, so yeah, but ask NVIDIA people. Sure. Uh, so Michael Patrick asks, if you put a IPsec key material on the DPU, could you isolate and protect that from the host, uh, or would the host be able to access that? Yeah, so at, I was saying that there are multiple modes that you can run the DPU in, and in the one we're doing, I think it's called separated mode or something. Um, from the host, 
the DPU just looks like a NIC. Like it has no way of, of interacting with it as anything other than just a NIC. Um, other than by making an IP connection out, you know, to the IP address of the NIC, and then it can do whatever services the, the NIC is, is exporting. So yes, you can put whatever you want there and people on the host have absolutely no access to it. Uh, for IPsec right now, the, well, I guess we could run IPsec in software on the ARM system, but the IPsec offload support currently not working. So uh, I noticed uh, one uh, one thing in the discussion here where uh, it, it seems that some people took your analogy to a Raspberry Pi literally. So it, it isn't literally a Raspberry Pi that's on the NIC, right? It is not. <laughs> okay, just checking. So uh, Demetra Sierra asks, if OVN databases are still on the host cluster, doesn't it mean that attackers breaking into the host cluster will potentially be able to inject logical flows, open flows, to spoof or inspect traffic from the NIC cluster? Yeah, this is something that we're still trying to figure out the, the best way to organize that, um, which, which way it ends up making more sense. Right now, the host cluster is basically completely unaware of the NIC cluster. So we didn't want to have the, the host OVN or, or it, it gets the, the, the host OVN cube node CNI has to up, uh, annotate the pods in the API server to indicate what VFs it, it got. The communication just gets very confusing. Um, but yes, we, we are wondering if the current arrangement is the best way of doing it or if yeah, we may end up changing it in the next. Sure, uh, security uh, issues are always uh, uh, tricky. Uh, so, and then finally, uh, from Aaron Smith, we have the question, does the NIC have privilege access to the host? Uh, it doesn't, uh, I mean, it doesn't inherently, um, you know, you, you, you could put software on the NIC that, you know, has an SSH key to root on the host or whatever, but um, I'm pretty sure it doesn't have any privileged access to the host. Um, Certainly not in the way that we're using it. Got it. Uh, so, uh, oh, we have uh, one more question that just appeared. Uh, so, uh, Mohammed El Sergawi asks, is it one NIC per node, or uh, can the NIC route to many nodes? Um, so, the, the way that we are currently architecting it, it is one NIC per node. Um, you, yeah, you, you could have one NIC acting for many nodes, but I mean, then you lose the advantage of having it inside the node, right? You could just have random server uh, on your network acting as the man in the middle rather than having it as, as a NIC in one of the servers, but still intercepting traffic for other servers. That would, uh, there yeah, are people that, who are that, talking about putting multiple um, Bluefield 2s in a single host as well for some reason. Um, I don't know exactly what they want to do with that. Well, uh, I mean, would that be just for uh, for more bandwidth, or, or would that be for more computation power? Uh, have you uh, have you heard anybody's thoughts on that? I haven't. You haven't. Okay. So uh, we we have a couple more minutes. Uh, do you have any sort of final thoughts uh, or, uh, or or things that you didn't uh, quite get a chance to get to in in your uh, in your talk? Maybe for future plans. Um, I mean, I mentioned future plans a little, and they're they're still somewhat vague and based on what we learn from the next uh, preview. So, all right. Uh, well, uh, let's uh, give a, a virtual uh, uh, round of applause to Dan.